Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for, for stopping by. I am beyond excited uh, to speak today with Jennifer Walsh, who, well, rather than me telling you your story, I, I kind of <laughs> want to, I want you to tell the audience and the listeners what it is that you do, because what I, what I think you do is super fascinating, but I, I just, I think I'm just scratching the surface. So kind of when you introduce yourself professionally, what is it that you do? How do you keep busy? Sure. That's a great starting point because you're right. It's like, I feel like I do a lot of different things that touch on lots of different industries, but, um, yeah. and thank you so much for having me today, David. I mean, yeah. just, I really enjoy everything that you share. We became friendly because of social media, because mm -hmm. of LinkedIn, and I love yeah. your enthusiasm for, for your curiosity about mm -hmm. like learning new things and the people you, I just, I really enjoy everything that you thank share. You. So, thank um, thank you for having me to just talk about things and, um, so yeah, my, my background's actually in beauty. So I've been in the beauty industry for almost 30 years and I'm getting to that first because it kind of dovetails into what I'm doing now, but yeah. I started a company called beauty bar back in 1997. So I had this idea to take beauty out of a department store setting. And this is the pre Sephora pre Ulta days. Mm. And I had a weekly TV segment promoting beauty brands that were pretty unheard of at the time. So people really didn't know who Bobby Brown was or, uh, Stila and all these brands people know about yeah. today. But so I had this TV segment, people would call my home office and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of these brands before. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I could use that TV segment as my educational tool and open a store and sell the product. So that'd be my sales channel. And I just called the brands and said, I had this idea. What do you think? And they're like, okay, sure. Here's some products. And I didn't know anything about retail. Uh, and I, created this little space. It was 600 square feet at the beginning and I wanted it to feel good. I wanted it to have wood features and green and water features and plants and lots of natural light and different kinds of sounds and beats. And every person that came to my store said, you're doing it all wrong. No one cares about the interior of a store. And I said, well, I don't care. It's my money. <laughs> I had like $30,000 in savings wow. and that was all I had to start the business. Wow. And long story short, I grew the business and was bought out in 2010. So Amazon now owns Beauty Bar and beautybar.com. And I started a few other brands, CPG brands. Um, Pride and Glory was another Bath and Body Care line for the college market. I was creating products for University of Florida, FSU, Vanderbilt, like all these schools. Mm -hmm. And then by 2016, I started a video series called Walk with Walsh because Facebook Live had just come out. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to interview my friends that are CEOs about what it meant to be a healthy leader? And long story short, every person I interviewed, we, we were walking in Central Park and every person I interviewed kept saying, this feels so good, I never get outside. Mm. And like you understand, because of where you are right now, like I thought, who, how, do you, how are you not outside? What do you mean you don't go outside? Yeah. But these people were going out mostly on the weekends or on holiday. And that's yeah. when my studies really started in what our brain, what happens to our brains when we're exposed to nature versus going through what Richard Louv coined a uh, nature deficit disorder. And I've wow. been just like down this rabbit hole ever since. And it's been mind blowing and fascinating. And I love it because again, that ties back to everything I've done in my life has been about getting back to like beauty, what beauty really means. And it's really nature. And the stores were all, it bio, now we know it's called biophilic design. There was no name for it when I started, um, but now everyone's creating spaces with biophilic design. And so now I thought, wow, I'm really glad I didn't listen to all the people that told me I, I'm doing it all wrong because <laughs> it didn't wow. look like anything they had seen before. That's so, amazing. Pioneer, so yeah. that, that's a badass pioneer. Take whatever word you want, but that's amazing <laughs> that you were at the forefront of it before the words really existed to describe what it is that you do. So very briefly, I was born on a farm in Poland surrounded by woods and, and and meadows and so i i that's my sort of penchant and my bias i love nature what yeah. about you what what sort of spurred that idea of like bringing the nature indoors it was kind of just i wanted people to feel something um yeah because i feel like every time i went shopping in a department store it just was cold it was uninviting it just didn't feel good to me mm. i never felt anything i was just kind of like went to a store and did the thing and that was it um, so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to really have people? And I didn't know if people would, it would resonate, but I wanted, I wanted to make it feel like my home. Yeah. So if you want to come in and I want the people to feel welcome and had really cool sounds of different beats of music. So my friend worked at NPR 
and found this European music and mixed it together. And so people are always asking me, like, can we buy, can we buy your, your soundtrack? And I said, yeah. I can't, <laughs> I okay. can't tell you that it would be illegal, but we had yeah. like, we had our own music, our own CDs, CDs back then. Yeah. And we had really fun music. And again, so every store after that, so every store I had, we had made sure it was all natural light, lots of big windows. And what's really cool now is there's so many interesting studies around natural elements, sounds on the human, you know, the human body, uh, what happens when you have natu natural light indoors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been really fun to kind of witness this whole new um, awareness of how our spaces really impact us. And so my work primarily now is really educating people and going into corporations and helping them understand what's going on with biophilic design and how do we make our brands more aware of nature versus just sustainability. Mm -hmm. it's such a push for sustainability, but that word came to be 50 years ago. And we're so far past that. <laughs> we can't, we mm -hmm. can't keep doing what we're doing because no. it's not, it's been really bad for the planet. So how do we think about no. nature versus just sustainability? I think that's the missing link that people are forgetting to talk about. It's wow. all about nature. So, yeah. So, yeah. So if you had to define uh, biophilic design for like a lay person like me, yeah. right? Like where I have like a, an idea of what it might be, but I, I haven't looked up the definition and I'm not even curious about the textbook definition. I'm curious about um, Jennifer Walsh's definition. So <laughs> what, 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 what does that mean for you, biophilic design? Oh, David, I love that. Uh, it's really about bringing the natural elements indoors. So how do we maximize our spaces that bring health and well-being and feeling and emotion back to our spaces? Um, because so many places just lack anything that makes you feel good. So you think about some of the offices that you go to, they're just cold and miserable and uh, there's no feeling there. There's no emotion. So really bringing natural elements in. I have, and a lot of people think biophilic design means plants and it's so much more than that. It really has a lot to do with how do we minimize man-made noise. Like I live in New York city right now. I'm in New York city, I should say. And yeah. uh, it's a lot of construction and lots of honking horns. So then I try and have my YouTube channel on and have extreme sounds or mm. there's so many things you can do to really maximize the health and well-being of a space without it costing a lot of money. You really don't have mm. to do a lot. It's just an awareness, to be honest. Yeah. So that's why I was so thankful when you invited me to come on, because I really feel like the more the people know how this impacts your health and well-being, the more you want it to be shared everywhere because yeah. it's so it's so important. Um, people in senior care facilities, I have a twin sister that's profoundly disabled in a in a group home. I see what her life is like indoors and it's um in you know it's in an institution and those places yeah. are not well funded to have beautiful spaces. So she loves to be outside. So the minute we bring her outside in a wheelchair, she just screams because she's so excited. Yeah. So it's you know, we are, we were, you know, 99.9% .9 of our uh, DNA comes from the natural world. It's only been since the industrial revolution that we had the greatest migration inside and it's mm. really changed our lives. And we have archaic brains still in our bodies, but we are living in a very, very heavily futuristic world for yeah. our brains. So we have to try and our brains really can't keep up with what's happening. So we have to remember that we really evolved outside. So no wonder we love the the sound of the trees rustling and we love bird song and it makes us feel good. It's and look at you with a beautiful greenery behind you. It's just relaxing. Yeah. To, it's relaxing to look at you, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. I wore green. I don't know the dark green, but it's green. Green and blue are my favorite colors. So anytime I'm in nature, Thanks. I'm a happy boy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, amazing. That's exactly it. It's your we are happier. We are happier human beings and we are exposed to the natural world. And I have to also like also say there's also the elements of nature that are scary and bad and think about flooding and natural disasters. I mean, that's True. scary. Um, and there's something known as biophobia. Mm. Biophobia is this fear of the natural world. So, and unfortunately it's growing. Biophobia is now growing in an exponential way that people are really fearful because again, more and more kids are spending more and more time indoors and they're not exposed to nature. They're not exposed mm -hmm. to climbing trees and playing with rocks and sticks and things that I did as a kid. Same. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's nature's always been a part of my life, even though I grew up in the Bronx. And I was telling you before we jumped on that I went to high school in White Plains. Yeah. Lived in Peekskill, New York for a while. 
uh, lived in Florida for 15 years, but I've been living in New York, but you know, Central Park has been my, my backyard. I think every New York City person calls Central Park your backyard. Yeah, so, that's yeah. fascinating. I I um I also know that you live in a very special place, I think, for most of the summer. Kind of explain what it is, what that community is, and what that, what that means for you. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So it's funny. I was hoping I could do this recording from my tent today. But um, I live in a tent from May 15 to September 15. And this is my 35th summer in the tent, which is crazy. Uh, yeah, it's in, in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. So just two hours south of New York City. And this town is an old Methodist town that was built from tents. And only 114 still exist. And they're still there. So there's it's half tent, half cabin. The tent is my ten, 20, 12 by 16. It's not big. 12 feet wow. by 16 feet. And then the cabin has a kitchen, bathroom, and living room. And yes, there's Wi-Fi. And yes, there's air conditioning. There's an air conditioning unit. Um, but I didn't use air conditioning, I think maybe except once last summer yeah. and it's two blocks off the ocean. So I very rarely need, like I, I didn't have any air conditioning on yet this wow. year. Yeah. So, um, it's a lovely way to exist in complete harmony with the natural world. I mean, I, I'm up before five every day because it's bright in the tent. Mm -hmm. Sun's already semi coming up. Sun, sunrise is now at five twenty, So I go for a sunrise swim every morning and it's Love just- that. The pig, like I take pictures every morning out there because it's just so awe-inspiring. It's just it just sets the tone for the day because I'm just so moved with like gratitude that I get wow. to do this. Um, that's that's amazing. You you talked about setting setting the tone for the day just now, and I'm wondering, um, is there a ritual that you have when you arrive in the tent? Do you like to set the tone for the season, or or not so much, or is it just, just sort of organic? It <laughs> it's yeah. just it's exciting because all the neighbors that we've known for thirty plus years uh 35 are all there so uh -huh. it gets so the tents get handed down from generation to generation it's like we have a rental it's we, we don't own it we rent yeah. it um so you pay your rent every year and then let's say my my parents are the first people on the list on the you know the lease if they don't want it yeah. long then it comes to me and if i don't want it gotcha. it goes to my sister and if she doesn't want it then it gets put up on the adopt me adopt me yeah exactly <laughs> I've seen a picture or two, and and I think um you know I'll I'll include when I pu publish this I'll include um a, a a link to either the article that was written about you or or one of those photos it was it looked magical. Oh, it is. It's really you know I, I get to grow my vegetables. Everyone shares like our little name. It's just yeah. It's just it's really magical. I'm I'm grounding every day. I don't have to wear my shoes all over the place. I can wear. I don't have to. I can go barefoot to walking up to the beach. Yeah. Or, you know, walk barefoot back. Um, and I'm just in community with one another. Mm -hmm. So we are like, we are really in living in community in a very, very tight quarters, one tent next to the other. And we can hear each other. We sneeze or cough and it's, <laughs> <laughs> we're very courteous. Everyone's very courteous. And it's just, it's a really lovely way to just, I sat on the porch two nights ago with my neighbors across the way and we just had some snack, like want some cheese and crackers. Oh yeah. I want some you know, glass of something. Sure. Here you go. And it's just, it's just community. And it's really, we look wow. out for each other. It's just yeah. lovely. I don't have that in New York city. I don't even know half the people I've lived here for almost 15 years in this apartment. And I don't yeah. even know half the people. And you're not alone there. That's a, that's a common narrative that I hear. Yeah. Um, you, I, might, I think if I recall, you had said that sort of like this um, misconception was that it always has to be about plants, right? Biophilic design always have to be about plants. And there are so many more like elements and dimensions to that. But are there any other I don't know, misconceptions or myths that you want to debunk or like misconceptions about what you do for people like that you constantly constantly have to say, oh, actually, it's not that it's this. Not really. I think it's just uh, there's such there's so many different things that I get to do that mm -hmm. it's fun because I get to kind of tap into all my work in the beauty industry and yeah. there's so much happening in beauty, but I got to kind of then bring beauty to a different landscape. How do we feel in beauty? How does beauty move us? And it's not just about the products you know, all the products on my desk, all the products I get every day. Um, but it's, you know, it's really about how we feel and how beauty makes us feel when we're in the presence of mm. awe-inspiring conversations mm. or people or moments and scenery and art and music. I mean, that's what really, I feel like beauty is really what life is yeah. uh, without the stress, like strip away the misconceptions and the perceptions and yeah. everything. And you just, you're human in a space that we had this, this life that we often just kind of 
move right through and we forget like how lucky we are. So going back to your yeah. question, I get to do, I get to write about beauty and wellness in different magazines and walking. I do a lot of walking. I lead wellness walks in Central Park. So I call that my classroom in my office. Mm. So I get to teach about biophilia and biophilic design as we walk, walk and talk. And um, yeah, it's really, it's really fun. And I get I write articles for different magazines. I'm still That's on amazing. TV every month. So it's been my 27th year on air this year, nice. which is crazy to say that. More is it, do life. you think, is it an easier sell? I guess, it, you know, in recent years, post COVID era, is it an easier sell for companies and organizations yes. and people to be a little bit more open to this? Oh, that's a great question. That's such a good point because it was tough before COVID. So 2016, 2017, I was like, tell you, let's go for, like, let's get your team out for a walk. You're like, oh, we don't have time for that. Mm. But you have time to go, you're, you're hosting a hit class or yoga but this is yoga for the brain and teaching mm. what happens to your brain on nature. Like this is so Love important it. for mental yeah. health, not just going to a studio, like moving your body freely outdoors yeah. is so good for you. It's so much better for you than being inside. And so there's a lot more awareness. So thankfully people are saying, oh, you've been doing this for a while. You have the studies. And it's also the study aspect. I wanted to make sure, and I know you understand this too. It's It's one thing to say it feels good, and yes, we we love it, but it's another thing to have the science behind it. And mm -hmm. people love the science. So yeah. I was really looking for the right people to partner with or have people I could really lean on and work with. So it took me a few years, but now I've, uh, I'm a um, faculty advisor at the Brain Health Initiative, which is under Harvard, and also one for UPenn, the Center for Neuroaesthetics. So there are two Ooh. different neuroscientists I get to work with and do research and share their work as well. And it's it's really... Wow. It's really good. There's so many young people that are doing such cool work. I'm just always in awe of how young people are really interested and intrigued about the brain. As much yeah. I wish I, I wish I could go back a little bit and also maybe be a scientist, but I don't think I have the stomach for it. But, <laughs> but I guess the fact that you you can be the, the well, you are the bridge, the translator, right? Between the science and the and the rest of the world. And that is a critical sort of keystone role that you play that a lot of people you know, they they um they don't know how to kind of translate that, and and I think you do a really fantastic, compelling, beautiful job of that. It, it resonates with me. Wow, Debbie, thank you, thank you. Um, I um I believe that you know I'm a big believer that there is. I mean, yes, sometimes we make mistakes, and hopefully we don't repeat them too too often. But are there any either failures, mistakes, biggest kind of challenges that that um that you faced uh in in your in this line of work in this sort of unique niche? Um, well, I mean, I've been in business for myself for 27 years. Mm. Um, so not necessarily right now, but I've had major, major things happen in business. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say failures, but they were lessons learned. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've had to, um, you shutter one of my businesses, which was heartbreaking and, uh, lost a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> I lost a lot of money. So, but that's the whole, that's the whole thing of being an entrepreneur. You can't just, you know, if you're married to the end game, it's going to be a problem. So you have to really accept it as a journey and mm. it takes so many different paths to get you down it. And sometimes the whole point of, of that journey was the path itself and the people you meet along the way, it wasn't the end game. And I had to learn that because that's not something I was taught. Like, Hey, it's not really about the end. It's about the whole experience of what you're creating. That's the beauty of it. But there's a lot of hardship with that. I've, you know, I had to go through a pretty rotten and miserable divorce. Mm -hmm. My, um, I had to get rid of my house in Florida, yeah. and sell my company. And it's a, there's been a lot of bumpy roads. This has been, I've, I've had never had a rose colored glasses. It's been really, right. right. <laughs> well, you mentioned nature. Nature can be brutal too, right? The, the floods, the fires, the, the, the cleansing as it were, and the, the cycles and, and sometimes that applies in our life. I mean, we are animals. We are so part true. of nature. So that's so fascinating. True. Are there any projects that you're, I mean, it doesn't matter when, when uh, whether they're recent or upcoming or, or, or in the past that you, that you want to kind of maybe brag about or that were particularly cool or innovative or fulfilling? Um, I think you touched on a few earlier on, but I'm curious, is there one that stands out? Well, there's quite, I mean, it's kind of fun. Like, there's a whole bunch of things I get to do, which yeah. I love. And there's a senior center I'm doing some work with up in Riverdale in the Bronx. Um, but I also love, like, we started doing these recharge rooms back in 2018, which was bringing 
actually the tent. It's almost like exactly the tent I have and bringing them as activations into mm. corporate clients, especially here mm. in New York City. And it was it was bringing what it's like to live in a tent into like Viacom or something, mm -hmm. yeah. which we did. And it was like a wellness day. And people just had to schedule their 15 minute session just to be in a tent and lay down and listen to the sounds and what it's like. And also the visuals, it's like they're called fractal patterns. So let's say like the leaves uh, from the tree above you there, the shade is on the tent. Mm -hmm. And we as humans love fractals because mm -hmm. again, we feel like we are in nature. So we feel relaxed and at ease. And it's not something we think about. We're not saying, yeah. oh, there's a fractal. I'm going to feel good now. It's just in our DNA to say, oh, that's mm. that's soothing to me, or I'm relaxed here in this environment. So the recharge rooms were an idea because of the tents that I the tent that I've been living in. And now we have people that want them for their for permanent structures and their corporations. Wow. Uh that's cool. Homes. That's so, so cool. Yeah, it's really I'm gonna afterwards i'm not not tonight but like you know at some point i'm going to ask you for some for some of those photos because i'm just i'm in awe and i'll say this that when i used to work in midtown manhattan mm. uh, at several companies a couple of times i would be either near a smaller park or central park and and my uh my coworkers would often utter well it would be so cool if i could you know if i could you know enjoy a central park and i'm like you can it's literally right a block and a half away or <laughs> and but the thing is, they didn't, whether they had like high power jobs or they were workaholics or yeah. whatever their excuse or le legitimate or quasi legitimate or BS excuse was. The thing is, they never did. And so at least bringing some of those natural elements in can help them feel some of that levity and that joy and that wonder and that spirit that nature uh, provides us for free. Right. Yes. So I love that you're bringing it in because there are people like me and, 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 and you who will go outside because we love it. But then there are people, whether it's full-blown I think biophobia or just the the, the vicissitudes and the you know the day-to-day -day, they're not going to allow themselves the nature time so I think what you're doing is is a great bridge I think thank you I really appreciate that I really do it's um I I just so love what I do and I'm appreciative that I get to do it and it's been mm -hmm. a very interesting windy road to get to this but it's always been there it's like pulling that string of like what really yeah touches you what matters in your heart is community to me and and mm -hmm healthy people and having communities that are healthy and that are joyful and kind and loving. And that's, I think that's why we're here. That's why we're oh, here. Yeah. I, I, and I love, don't get me wrong. I love jogging or, or trekking or hiking solo, but I also love it as, as, a, as part of a smaller intimate group. I think there's just um, really cool conversations and, yeah. you know, the brain patterns start to change and the topics yep. start to evolve and it's just a cool cool reset yeah. for, for, for me. So I think both, right. I, I don't think it has to be a solo effort. I don't think it has to always, for me, I, I, I choose the path of, and yes, and of both solo and, and communal in nature. It's, it's what works for me. Yeah. Right. So. And meet people where they are. Everyone's a little different. So yeah. I love being by myself on my walks in the morning, but I also love walking with people in the afternoon. And that's right. It's, it's really fun. It's really fun. And to have people like open their eyes, like, Oh, I always knew this felt good, but no one ever gave me permission to say yeah. why it feels good so i, I want yeah. to uh i want to I, I i think during covid we tried and we failed but it's okay because it might happen yeah. anew but t talk to people if, if someone wanted to um join you on one of those uh nature walks tell me how, how they could kind of sign up or what the process would, would look like yeah i do them it depends on a, t a team will hire me a hotel group will hire me uh person will just say because I don't have them set is like a, like a it. class it's yeah. more like call me let me know when you want to do them mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. because yeah schedules are so different and I don't have the same schedule every day That's so right. it's uh yeah people can find me on LinkedIn or Instagram or walkwithwalsh.com and they can schedule Perfect. something and and do it with their team and doing lots of lunch and learns right now too to kind of talk about nature awareness and how it impacts business how it impacts us and communities so yeah it's really fun it's been really that's amazing generally. i my 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 inkling is that what you do sparks or like it's a it's, it's a spark or a reminder for people right because most people um even if you're living in you know hustle and bustle of new york city most people that i talk to when they were young they talk about oh you know i would go visit the farm or i would go yeah. you know for summers upstate and in nature and they pine for that they yearn for that and so what you do is is you're sparking that that you're catalyzing that um, something that's already within them. It's not necessarily something completely brand new, but maybe something that they've 
severed or disconnected from or put on the back burner for too darn long. Yeah. So <laughs> that's how I see that is, I mean, you do more than that, but that is, is a, I think a big part and an important part of, of what you do for so many people. So I just wanted to thank you for, for being uh, you and for doing all that you do and all that you are. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you, David. I really appreciate awesome. you having me. I really love a conversation with you. Awesome. Take good care and uh, we'll be in touch. Absolutely. Bye-bye.